Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I am uh, Maciej Mazurowski. Uh, I work uh, here at Duke as a, as a faculty. Um, welcome to the um, next uh, Duke Spark uh, seminar. Um, uh, Duke Spark is a, a community of uh, researchers and uh, clinicians and others. Um, uh, we share a goal. Uh, of developing and uh, testing and implementing uh, AI algorithms for uh, medical imaging. Uh, here is uh, where to find us. So uh, you can find uh, the updates and uh, some information about what we do on uh, Twitter, uh, at Duke underscore Spark. Uh, there is some information on the website and uh, we uh, would love to work with you. Uh, and so if you, you're interested in uh, joining and working with us, uh, please email me at uh, maciej.mazurowski at uh, duke.edu. I am uh, very happy to introduce uh, uh, our speaker today, uh, Alberto Bartosaghi. Uh, Alberto uh, got his uh, PhD at University of uh, uh, Minnesota in electrical engineering. And uh, since then he worked at uh, the uh, National Cancer Institute. And uh, more recently, since 2018, he is a uh, faculty uh, here in Duke, at Duke, and uh, uh, he's working on uh, cryo-electron microscopy for health applications. Uh, so I'll, I'll hand it off to Alberto. Uh, but before that, uh, let me just mention that uh, um, we would like to uh, hear and answer questions. So uh, throughout the uh, throughout the seminar, please put them in the in the Q and A uh, box uh, here, and uh, we'll address as many as we can uh, toward the end of the the hour. Uh, Alberto. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to try to share screen. Okay, I'm assuming you can see that fine. Uh, I can see it, yes. All right, great. All right, welcome everyone. Um, so I'm gonna talk today about this, um, you know, specific area of cryo-electron microscopy that I've been working on for several years now. Uh, and as you can see here, my affiliation, um, I span the departments from the School of Medicine, the, uh, the Department of Biochemistry, uh, to Arts and Sciences, Computer Science, and Electrical Engineering in the Pratt School of Engineering. Um, so I'm gonna give, start by giving a, sort of like an overall introduction of what CryoEM really is, because it's a little bit not your typical you know, medical imaging application. So I'm gonna try to you know, position ourselves in you know in this the spectrum of scales when we look at biology with using different technologies uh, so essentially you probably be most familiar with this side of the spectrum uh, where we looked at uh, you know whole organisms and typically the technologies we use for looking at those is our x-rays uh, nmr or you know even light obviously and then as you go to the left and look, start looking at smaller and smaller uh, organisms, uh, you, there's other techniques that come into, the, into place that allow you to actually look at um, you know, biological structures at a much smaller scales. Uh, if I jump all the way to the left side of the spectrum when you're looking at individual molecules, uh, it happens to be that you can also use you know, X-ray and NMR to look at you know, very tiny things, uh, but also, uh, in, in this whole range right here, you can use electron microscopy and in particular high resolution cryo electron microscopy that allows you to look at you know, very small things, but also all the way through protein complexes and you know, uh, viruses, uh, large viruses. So it, it spans this very interesting range of uh, you know, entities in, in, in biology that you cannot actually look at using just pure light because the wavelength is, is not small enough. So that's just to give you a sense of you know, where are we gonna be 
uh, you know, diving into this talk is going to be everything, you know, biological entities that live in these sides of the spectrum. And what that typically will look like are going to be these uh, proteins. So proteins are essentially, you know, the machinery of life. They come in different sizes and different shapes, and they carry out uh, specific functions that are actually critical uh, for uh, carrying out uh, life. Uh, and also in particular for, for disease, you know, for understanding disease, for deciding drugs and so forth. So here in this movie, I'm showing the 3D, the three-dimensional structure of uh, a handful of individual proteins that are involved in, in different processes as, as an example. Um, so there's obviously a tremendous amount of importance in understanding what those proteins look like in, in 3D. So, and, and the reason for that is that uh, the structure is directly related to the function that these molecular machines carry out. Um, so there is this structure function paradigm that essentially says, you know, given the, the structure of the three-dimensional disposition of the atoms in a particular uh, molecule, then that dictates the function that that protein carries out. And obviously, this is very important for understanding the mechanistic basis of disease and also for designing drugs, as I was uh, uh, indicating before. So just to give you like a very basic uh, idea of what that look like, looks like, uh, I put a cartoon here of uh, a protein, which is this uh, cartoon here in, in green, uh, and then if I'm trying to design a ligand, maybe that actually binds to that uh, protein so that can interfere with it, its function, it will be useful to actually understand precisely what the shape of the protein is. So we can design a ligand that can actually dock in precisely into that pocket. And then that way interfere with the function that uh, we're trying to interfere with. Um, and you can see that here I'm showing three different shapes of ligands, and there's only one of them that has perfect shape complementarity with the protein, and that's the one that will actually uh, uh, dock more efficiently, and, and the other ones, the, you know, the docking will not be as tight, and then the, maybe the, the effect that I'm trying to uh, impose on this protein will not, will not be very effective. Um, so one example of this is drug design. Uh, you can actually use this process, the structure-based drug design to actually uh, neutralize uh, viruses, for example, or other entities. Uh, so it's obviously tremendously important to be able to understand the protein, the 3D shape of protein, so you can actually you know, go through this exercise of designing drugs or understanding how biology actually works at the molecular level. Um, Assuming that you know, many of the people in the audience here are familiar with advances in AI in general, not just in medical imaging, but also in, you know, in other areas, you may have heard about uh, uh, DeepMind's advance of uh, AlphaFold uh, a couple of years ago in, in 2020, where essentially you know, they, they designed uh, algorithms based on AI that could actually predict the three-dimensional shape of proteins from the from the sequence, right? And I'm not going to go back and give you a whole uh, course on biochemistry here, but essentially uh, the sequence is sort of like uh, um, the the chain of amino acids that uh, make up a protein. So essentially, by knowing a sequence, they can actually predict the three-dimensional structure. Uh, and this is by taking advantage of, you know, experimental derived structures that have been deposited in, in a database. And actually, uh, a couple of, uh, two or three years ago, uh, and this is the, the screenshot on the right, um, using these techniques, uh, you know, they were able to uh, predict the structure of, you know, over uh, 200 million proteins uh, just purely from the sequence without you know, taking out, uh, you know, without taking any measurement, any experimental measurements whatsoever. So this on itself, you know, has shaken up uh, the, the, um, the field of uh, structural biology in general, and it's a very important advance. But what I'm gonna tell you about today is a little bit of on our orthogonal direction. And the way we're going to do determine this three-dimensional structure is not by uh, doing predictions, but 
it's by actually taking measurements on a, an imaging device. And the imaging device that we use is an electron microscope, which you can see on this slide here. Uh, so this is obviously, you know, it's a very significant piece of machinery <clears throat> that you use to image uh, proteins at, at, at molecular resolution. And uh, you're going to see in a second now why we call this cryo electron microscopy, but essentially this is the experimental setup that we're going to be using. <clears throat> now, the way we're going to do this is uh, <clears throat> proteins normally live on a, you know, in, in cells inside our, our bodies. And uh, the way or a simplified way we have of looking at these proteins is we actually uh, purify those proteins from the native environment. And now we have a solution where we only have copies of specific uh, protein that we're interested in, in studying. That's the uh, whole step is called protein purification. And then what we do is we deposit a drop of that solution that has our purified protein into a, a, a cryo-electron grid. So essentially it's a, a flat disk, which is uh, three millimeters in diameter. So it's a very small disk. Um, and then that drop is essentially frozen. That's where the cryo comes from. I'm gonna tell you in a minute why we, we need to do that. We need to freeze things. Uh, and then we take that grid into the microscope. And if you look inside the microscope, essentially you have your proteins which are suspended into a thin layer of ice. And then you have the electron beam coming through the sample, uh, going through the, the, the ice, uh, you know, scattering uh, by the, the static potential of the, of the proteins. And then on the other side of the microscope, you get an image, you essentially acquire a two-dimensional image where you can now see the projections of the individual proteins that were suspended in the ice. And this is the imaging step. Now, this is what a typical uh, CryoEM image uh, looks like. So you can see that it's very different from, you know, uh, like an MRI image or you know, any of the other uh, medical images that are probably used to looking at is probably closer to, uh, you know, a microscopy image. Uh, and, you know, there, there are different features in here, but the important ones are these darker um, densities. Uh, each of those correspond to an individual protein. So it's a, a, an image of an individual protein. And obviously they're individual, you know, each of them are very noisy, but when you combine enough of those projections from multiple orientations, you can actually produce a three-dimensional representation uh, of this protein that you were able to, to purify. And the actual image you're seeing here on the right is one that we used a, a few years ago uh, when we reported the first uh, two Armstrong structure of a protein using CRAO-EM um, in the journal of science. And then uh, a couple of years after that, uh, this technique was actually awarded uh, the Nobel Prize in chemistry because of the impact that it was having in you know, determining high resolution structures with you know, biomedical uh, relevance. Um, so I, if I wanna, I wanna go and take a step back and, uh, and explain you know, why are those images you know, so noisy um, and, and why do I need you know, multiple images to actually produce a single three dimensional structure. And the reason for that is that proteins are actually very sensitive to radiation, in particular to electron radiation. Uh, so electron radiation is very damaging to biological material. Uh, and we do a couple of things to compensate for that. So uh, the cryo preservation of the sample is done so that that uh, effect is minimized. So we lower the temperature uh, to you know, very cool temperatures, and that actually minimizes the, the, the effect of the electron radiation on the sample. But even then, we need to keep the radiation to you know, very low to actually prevent damaging the specimen and still get useful information out of these images. Uh, so this is sort of like you know, the, the reasoning behind why you know, these individual images are, are, are so uh, noisy and why do we need uh, uh, you know, what do we need to do in order to overcome that low signal to noise ratio? So the, the beauty here of this technique is that when you have enough of these images, and in this example, I'm showing a 3D uh, reconstruction that was produced from 10 million uh, individual particle projections. So that's uh, a, a lot of data. Um, 
And if you have that much data, you can actually produce a very high resolution uh, representation, uh, in this case of apoferritin, which is an iron storage uh, protein in the body. Uh, where if you can, if you zoom in into one of the asymmetric units, you can actually see uh, molecular detail, you can see the secondary structure and even some uh, features corresponding to, you know, atomic level uh, resolution features in this uh, 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 particular um, arrangement of atoms for, for, for apoferritin. Um, so this is obviously a very uh, powerful technique that is based on doing, you know, experimental determination of protein structure as opposed to doing protein prediction from uh, from uh, the, uh, a database. And actually, you know, this is the information or the the, yeah, the information that goes into training these uh, models by uh, AI models by DeepMind. They're all based on uh, determinant, determinant, uh, experimentally determined uh, protein structures that can then be uh, aggregated in, into these you know, training algorithms and trying to predict the, the um, structures of new proteins that haven't been determined before. So just to keep the story short, I'm not going to uh, talk about any more details about CryoEM, but you know, there's very good references out there if you're interested. Uh, a few years ago, we wrote this uh, um, uh, piece on the uh, IEEE signal processing magazine, uh, where you can learn all about, you know, the mathematical foundations be behind CryoEM image analysis, you know, the connection with more uh, standard fields like uh, statistics and uh, image processing in general. What are the computational challenges? Obviously, when you're dealing with large uh, volumes of data, you need to uh, uh, worry about that. And, you know, there's obviously a lot of open problems and opportunities for, for contributing to this field. So what I really wanted to tell you uh, today about is uh, this uh, uh, framework that we put together that is called SmartScope, right? And this is where the A part uh, comes in. Um, and this is very recent work that uh, it's uh, actually going to be uh, published very soon uh, on, on eLife uh, within uh, a week or so. Uh, so it's very recent work that uh, we did in collaboration with a group at the uh, um, NIHS uh, here in the RTP. And uh, essentially the, the problem we have is uh, this is about acquiring the data. Right. So I'm going all the way to the beginning data acquisition when I'm at the microscope with my sample and my goal is to actually acquire the data, right? I'm going to worry about the data processing later on, but this is just about acquiring the data. So if you remember, I have uh, my cryoEM grid, okay, which is you know very tiny three millimeter across grid. And then if I take that to the microscope, I can obtain an image that actually looks uh, like that, where you see the, the grid pattern, this is why we call this a grid. Um, and that actually represents like a very huge landscape where my sample has been all spread out, right? And because I'm in the microscope, I can actually increase the magnification and look inside, you know, this, uh, this huge landscape. And for example, if I zoom in into this uh, small uh, square, I get the second image here where you can see the scale bars here. So this is the 10 micrometer. And what I can see is I can see a different pattern of uh, holes in this case. And now if I zoom again, uh, zoom in again on this particular area, I get uh, this intermediate magnification image where I can see these holes now more clearly. And if I zoom in inside one of these individual holes, now I get uh, the, the high magnification data where I can see the individual proteins that are um, suspended uh, in the thin layer of ice inside each of these holes. Uh, so essentially, if you go back to the low MAC level, I actually have a, a very large landscape uh, of you know, these uh, square patterns and uh, uh, hole patterns where my sample is all spread out, right? And uh, as you can see uh, from this image in particular, the holes, they don't all uh, look the same. And we're gonna see uh, why uh, in, in, in a second, but the problem we're trying to solve here is we're trying to navigate the grid and only visit the areas that are actually gonna be useful, right? 
So most of the grid is actually not going to give us good information because uh, you know there's a lot of uh, features, and you know I'm all only care about imaging proteins, which are actually inside uh, uh, these individual holes. So one of the sources of variation of you know uh, across these different holes is the eye thickness, right? Uh, so in in this image you can see that there is no very there are brighter holes there are you know darker holes and then there are ones that are in the middle and i'm going to show you in a second why that's the case um so in this uh middle uh you know uh, not too dark not too bright uh, um, uh holes you can actually if you look from the side you can see that uh, the la layer of eyes actually looks like this. So it's essentially thin enough to actually contain uh, your proteins, but uh, it, it's, it's not too thin or not too thick. It's just the right height, right? And those are the areas that we actually are interested in, 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 in imaging for doing the high resolution structure determination. If you look at the darker patches, uh, what happens there is that the eyes is actually too thick. So when the ice is too thick, that will actually lower uh, the amount of electrons that go through the sample, and it will actually make those images uh, look noisier or look uh, darker in a way. And on the opposite side, the brighter holes, what happens is actually that the ice is uh, too thin, uh, too thin to actually even contain any particles. So it's not going to be useful to be taking images of those holes, right? So essentially we have this you know a very large landscape and now we need to uh, find a way you know an intelligent way of navigating this in an automated or unsupervised fashion uh, so th there are a few requirements in order to be able to solve this problem uh, successfully um, and obviously we need to do the navigation by and by only targeting the good area and uh, areas and skipping everything else and this has to be robust to different samples, different grid materials. Uh, there is a lot of variation in terms of those images that I'm going to show you in a, in a, in a, in a minute. Um, so essentially, for this to work on the field, uh, it requires there is a very stringent requirements of robustness. Um, and the way we're going to solve this problem is by uh, putting together two components. Uh, we're going to make a square uh, the detection and classification module. So this is essentially using uh, feature recognition algorithms uh, based on you know uh, on deep learning. Uh, so we're going to use one module for the square classification and another one for the hole detection. Um, and then uh, we're going to put those together to actually you know obtain a way of mapping this entire a feature space on a particular grid so you can then devise a navigation strategy to actually get to the good areas of the grid. Now in the first level for the square detection and classification, um, I'm not going to tell you about the particular details, but you now if anyone is interested, there is, you know, I'm going to be uh, adding references to, to, to the end of these sections. Uh, so in this particular case, we're used to using a faster RCNN uh, which allows us to do simultaneous detection uh, and classification. So essentially this is a fully supervised approach where you have, uh, we have a set of input atlases that we uh, collect in our facility. And then we provide label, labels for each of the squares uh, where we give the locations and then uh, we assign a category, whether it's a good square, uh, if it's cracked, contaminated, it's partial, small, dry, et cetera. Um, and then we, we do a usual sequence of steps where we you know, train uh, this network uh, using you know, different uh, augmentation techniques uh, to train the, the detector and the classifier. And then we have a train model. Uh, and once we do, you know, we collect a new atlas on the microscope, we uh, apply uh, the train model, and now we have as output uh, the location of each of the individual squares. And not only the location, but now we have also labels that indicate you know, whether that's a correct square that I probably you know want to skip during data collection, or whether I'm looking at a you know a good quality square that I would want to use for for image. Um, now, just to give you a sense of 
uh, you know, what kind of robustness is needed to solve this problem properly. I'm showing here uh, two columns. So the gold and carbon that refers to the, the material of the grids. Uh, so on the gold grids, obviously the, the, the contrast and the appearance of the squares is actually very different from that of the um, uh, squares in the carbon grids. And you can see that the contrast is, is reversed. Uh, and then you need this, you know, the detection and the classification to work reliably for both types of, of grids uh, because they're used interchangeably in, in, the, in, in the experiments. Um, so, you know, using uh, these algorithms, we can obtain, you know, very high uh, uh, detection pre precision for at least, you know, the most important uh, classes. And, um, we can do something very similar uh, to the holes when so we don't do high magnification and we need to identify the holes uh, again uh, we have a, a set of training images and, and labels that uh, we can use uh, to uh, train a model in this case it's based on the uh, yolo detection layers and once we have the train model we can feed in the new data from the microscope and then we get the location of the holes on, on those images now, this is an example of a fairly easy one where you can, you know, very clearly see the holes uh, in, in this uh, image. Uh, but there are more difficult cases like this one uh, where the holes are a lot harder to see. And, you know, if you see the contrast, it actually alternates, you know, it can be all over the place. Uh, so these techniques actually allows us for the first time to uh, have a solution that is actually uh, robust enough that it can actually work uh, on, on the actual experiments on the microscope on day to day. Um, so this is essentially, you know, we put all of these tools together and uh, uh, on this, uh, you know, uh, web-based uh, user interface that actually runs uh, uh, on, on the microscope itself. And, you know, all this uh, feature recognition and classification is actually running on real time 24-7 uh, uh, and then that's actually providing the information that the microscope needs to actually navigate to the relevant areas of the grid. Uh, this is, you know, it has saved uh, a lot of time in the, in the facility and is essentially has substituted almost like 30 hours of intensive manual screening uh, a week by an operator actually sitting in front of the microscope, but just doing, uh, today we can just do lightly supervised uh, navigation that can actually run overnight. So that uh, allows us to use, you know, increased efficiency of, of the instrument. Uh, we can operate uh, this uh, remotely and it just, uh, you know, translates into a, lot, into a lot of savings and efficiency at, at, at the microscope itself. So I wanted to uh, touch on another, uh, another topic. So essentially SmartScope uh, is allowing us to get, you know, more data and faster than before, right? Uh, so that's essentially, you know, the, the bottom line because everything, you know, can be automated. Um, but we also explore, you know, uh, can we do actual uh, detection of individual proteins on these uh, more noisier images, if you wish, uh, like that I show at the beginning of the presentation. So detection is very important because, you know, this is actually the first step that we need in order to do protein structure the determination using CRAVM. And it's also important to, uh, for resolution because you know, the more particles uh, you have, the higher resolution you, you can achieve. And this is an example from a few years ago where from the same data, we were able to extract like 40,000 particles and get uh, some three-dimensional reconstruction. Uh, and then later on, we revisited the same data set and we were able to pull out more particles, so almost four times more particles. And that was one of the elements that actually contributed to having higher resolution in that uh, uh, three dimensional structure. And this is, you know, using the exact same raw data, but if you're able to extract more particles or better particles, we can actually come out ahead in terms of the final quality of the 3D reconstruction. Now, the challenges of this particular problem of uh, uh, object detection is that the images are obviously uh, very noise and the, very noisy and that the labels for training and are not you know, necessarily available. 
And the solutions that are out there are actually uh, mostly fully supervised approaches, meaning that you know, there's large training sets of uh, you know, particles that have been picked on multiple data sets. Um, but the problem is that uh, you know, these models, they don't really perform well on new data sets that haven't uh, been uh, added to the training set. And in particular, the detection is not very reliable at the lower uh, signal to noise ratios that uh, we get for some of the maybe smaller complexes in, in CrowdIN. So in order to address these problems, what we did is we explored the use of uh, multitask learning. So essentially we're using joint image uh, denoising, segmentation and detection all at the same time using uh, this uh, multitask training of a teacher model. Um, so essentially we have a, a, an input a tomogram that we can then extract some uh, shared picture maps uh, and then we bifurcate into uh, the different tasks. So we have the main task, which is the detection. That's the one we care about. And then we have a couple of auxiliary tasks. We have segmentation and denoising, and they each have the, you know, their own feature map that are, that are specific to those tasks. <clears throat> and each of these tasks, we actually produce an input. This will be the denoise image. This will be the segmented image, and this will be the detection. And then this information will actually feedback and then refine you know, that share feature map. And then you know, it will close this loop and you know, the optimization will take care uh, of optimizing this combined loss that uh, has all three components in. Um, so the second part of this is to actually try to use a consistency training to be able to get away with using smaller uh, training sets. Uh, and in this case, what we have is the unlabeled uh, image and the augmented image that are both put through the uh, teacher model. Uh, and then we compare the output and we enforce consistency uh, between the two. And that actually allows us to, uh, you know, to convert this into a weekly supervised approach where we need a, a lot fewer labels in order to you know, get uh, very good detection performance. So the the model uh, in this case is uh, this multitask model is composed of three terms. We have the denoising loss, and then we have the segmentation and the consistent regularization loss. And essentially, what this looks like is uh, at the architectural level is uh, something along these lines. So we have the noise image in the input, which is put through the denoising branch. The denoising branch uh, does not require clean images because uh, we use like a blind spot CNN that can leverage internal data statistics uh, because obviously, you know, clean images are not available in CrowEM. Um, so the output of that uh, uh, branch will actually produce the, uh, the image statistics and the noise statistics uh, will allow us to uh, produce a clean image that we can then put through the segmentation branch. And for the segmentation branch, we're using uh, positive, or positive and label learning, meaning that we only label a few positive cases of particles. We don't need, need the negative labels. And this allows us to get away with labeling other, you know, like less than 1% of the data. So if we have 40,000 particles, we only need to label like 200 particles, which is like a very small number. Um, and through the use of consistent regularization, we can actually get a, a state of the art uh, detection uh, performance, uh, which is you know, really what we care about in this final step of this uh, network. So we apply this on a, a number of different data sets. Uh, so here I'm showing like a low SNR and then like an even lower SNR um, where we have uh, the raw image and I'm zooming in the, this area right here so you can see the individual particles. And what we're trying to show here is that if you only do the noising on that image, uh, you get a performance uh, which is uh, not very good. But when you combine that with detection, you can actually uh, improve the denoising performance just because you're using this together with the detection. Uh, now, this for us is sort of like a side result because we don't really care about denoising. We only care about detection. But the fact that you know, this joint model can actually improve the performance of the, um, um, of the individual task is it, it, it's very clear, you know, uh, as, as we can see here. And then in the lower SNR example, you can actually see 
uh, uh, something similar that the joint model uh, it gives you better denoising performance than the, just doing the denoising only. What we really care about is the detection performance. And that's what uh, this figure is showing here. Uh, so on the very right, we have the ground truth, the uh, uh, results of the ground truth detection. Uh, these are the results of our joint model. And these are uh, other uh, alternative models that have been used for doing detection in, in, in crowd EM. And Obviously, you know, from the detection uh, point of view, the performance of the joint model, it, it's also much better, uh, not only on the low SNR example, but also in this lower uh, SNR uh, uh, quality images. Um, you can see that some of the algorithms completely miss all the particles. Uh, uh, Crayolo in this case, uh, picks some, but it misses a whole bunch. And then the joint model is able to get something that is not quite the ground truth, but it's actually uh, quite close and it only needs very few uh, uh, labels. So all of this can obviously be uh, quantified. And you know, for the denoising, we measure the, the PSNR in different ways and we can uh, verify that you know, our joint model uh, produces better denoising performance. And uh, likewise for detection using precision recall and F1 scores, uh, we can compare the performance, detection performance between all different these different variations, and uh, you know our uh, joint approach with the consistent uh, consistency regularization actually gives us you know gives the the best performance in in terms of the of detection. Now, the main reason we actually went through this exercise of picking particles in in two D on you know, on noisy versions of these two D images is because. What we're really after is looking at proteins in this uh, native environment inside the cell. Uh, so here you can see that uh, you know there's a lot of different proteins uh, inside the cell. It's like a very crowded environment, and it's the goal we're trying to pursue here is to actually pick out the you know uh, individual uh, species of proteins so we can determine the three-dimensional structures. Now. Before, uh, uh, I, maybe I'll just give you a couple of examples of what that looks like. So here I'm showing two uh, small cells. Uh, so these are uh, bacterial cells. So the one on the left is um, it's called Arman. And this is a very interesting type of cell that actually manages to survive in the extremely acidic mine located in, in California. So this is a very harsh environment and this uh, organism is actually able to thrive under those conditions. Um, and then inside you can see, you know, all this uh, electron density that actually captures all the complexity of all these networks of proteins, you know, interacting with each other. Um, the example on, on the right is uh, actually a bacteria cell, which is a, a, a predator of other bacteria. And you know, there are very interesting stories behind uh, or, or the mechanism by which this uh, bacteria can survive by attacking uh, e. coli, for example, but and I'm going to skip that uh, for today. But again, inside the cell, you can see all these you know, complicated network of proteins. And then what we're trying to do here is trying to do detection inside this, uh, this, uh, these cells of these individual proteins. And in order to do that, I need to introduce a, a, a variation of CRAOEM that actually allows you to look inside cells in 3D. And this is a, a technique called uh, cryo-electron tomography that actually allows you to look at proteins in situ, so inside the cell. And the way it works is, uh, you know, you have an intact cell, and then there is a process of thinning a specific area of that cell uh, uh, using a technology of pip million that actually allows you to uh, extract a very thin lamella that you can actually put in the microscope. And then what you do is you take that sample to the microscope, you take an image, and then you tilt the sample, you take another image, and then you tilt it in the other direction. And then you have a collection of projection images that you can put together into a 3D reconstruction. And that actually gives you a, a three-dimensional data of this particular area of the cell that you were able to mill out from the intact cell. Uh, just so you, you know, if you've never seen data like this, this is an example. Uh, where here you can actually see individual uh, viruses. So these are HIV viruses. Um, uh, just to, 
So you have an idea of where, what the data looks like. So you can see the, as the specimen is rotating, you can see all these projection images. Um, you can see what they look like and uh, you know how noisy they are and so forth. So this particular technique has actually been, uh, it's actually very important in, you know, in providing new biological discovery. Uh, and in particular, uh, when we look at viruses, it can be used to actually determine the structure of these um, uh, membrane uh, attached proteins that are actually, that mediate uh, viral fusion or infection. And uh, the way it works is these images are now three dimensional. So we can now uh, segment the variants in three dimensions. We can actually detect the locations of those proteins in 3D. And then we have a process of extracting those uh, sub volumes corresponding to individual molecules and then uh, aligning them and combining them by averaging to actually achieve some kind of uh, denoising that allows us to increase the resolution. So this technique is, you know, it's been. Uh, um, about for a while, uh, 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 several years ago, we used this to determine uh, the first uh, uh, native structure of the HIV spike uh, on, on viruses. And more recently, uh, you know, it's also been used this same technique to actually determine the three dimensional structure of these uh, uh, spikes on, the, on coronavirus, which were actually um, uh, important in providing um, information for, for, for drug design. Now, uh, just to uh, gloss over uh, the, the work that we did here, we essentially extended this uh, uh, joint framework to actually work in 3D. And now we can uh, apply these to 3D images. Uh, I'm obviously skipping through you know, all of the details, uh, but the bottom line is that we can use a weekly supervised uh, approach um, for, uh, uh, of, for uh, detecting the, these proteins inside these, the, these volumes. And we're using a variety of different uh, techniques combined together that essentially allows us to obtain a very good uh, detection performance uh, together with uh, you know, doing the denoising together with the detection and also doing this uh, weekly supervise where we only need you know, a few labels to actually be able to detect particles on an entire data set. Right? Um, so a typical data set will have, I'm showing here like a single cell, but a typical data set will have hundreds or even thousands of these cells. So it's very important to be able to, you know, only provide a few labels and then, you know, just apply to the entire data set and get, you know, the 40,000 particles or however many particles you need to produce uh, the three-dimensional uh, reconstructions. So in, in a nutshell, there are again, uh, quantitative metrics that allows us to, uh, quantify the denoising and detection performance. And the bottom line is that this will, you know, it cuts the training time, it, it requires smaller training data set, and we can, we can still get, you know, very good uh, detection performance. Um, so the last story that I want to tell you about is about uh, the structure of uh, a specific kind of viruses, uh, which is called uh, human endogenous retrovirus type K. Um, and, you know, skipping through the biology, uh, you know, essentially there is a structure intermediate here, which happens after budding, which is actually very critical. Um, um, it, it's a very critical assembly intermediate. Uh, so this particular virus is associated with uh, malignant tumors. And, and this uh, immature state represents uh, a key viral assembly intermediate, uh, actually meaning that if you can interfere with that, you can actually block infection, right? So studying the, uh, uh, the, the structure of a, a particular type of protein in this state, which is called uh, GAG or GAG, uh, it's, uh, it's actually very important uh, for, for designing uh, uh, methods to prevent infection for this particular virus. So we have a collaboration uh, with uh, Dr. Zhang at the University of Oxford, uh, where they were actually able to you know, image these uh, viruses and uh, you can see them in, in the image here. These are individual viruses. And in this case, we're uh, interested in uh, this GAG protein is actually located in that area of the virus. So essentially we have a very difficult um, 
detection problem where we actually need to detect uh, these proteins which are sitting on the surface of, of these inner shells of, of these viruses. So we can actually do this using you know, a combination of uh, segmentation and detection. And uh, we do this on uh, 1,500 viruses and we end up with uh, uh, 200,000 uh, individual uh, yellow dots here. Um, and if you take one of them and look at them in 3D, you can actually see you know, very low resolution features where you can tell you know, where the capsid domain is and you know, the membrane is outside, but essentially you, know, you, you cannot see very high resolution features because each of those are very noisy. But when you combine the 200,000 uh, together, you can actually get a near atomic resolution uh, representation of that uh, gag assembly. Uh, again, uh, using 200,000 volumes where you can now you know, uh, visualize the secondary structure and even you know, individual side chains that, uh, that make up uh, this particular protein. So, just to give you a, a sense, you know, this again, this structure was produced out of 10 million uh, 2D images. And if you're you know, in the AI field and particular image analysis, you may be familiar with ImageNet. So ImageNet has about 14 million images. So you know, a single data set in this case is the size uh, uh, comparable uh, to ImageNet. Uh, but you know, it takes up uh, a lot more space because the images are obviously bigger. So two terabytes compared to uh, 150 gigabytes, but just to give you a sense of the scale of what you know, uh, uh, solving an individual structure looks like in, in cryo electron tomography. So I think that's uh, about everything I wanted to share. So just have one slide for summarizing. Uh, so obviously cryo -AM is not, um, you know, unaffected by all these advances in AI. Uh, so we've shown that uh, specifically it can be very, very helpful in data collection. So SmartCop is being used in you know, uh, different facilities around the world uh, and it's saved you know, a lot of uh, hours and effort and increased efficiency of these uh, facilities. Um, obviously multitask learning has obviously been instrumental at uh, you know, detecting uh, proteins uh, in a weekly supervised uh, fashion. And specifically in a crowded cellular environment, it has provided a state of the art performance, which is actually very critical for determining the uh, protein structures in, in situ inside the cell. Uh, and that has you know, very important uh, consequences in terms of uh, biomedical imaging. So with that, I'd like to uh, you know, acknowledge our collaborators. Uh, for SmartScope, we work with uh, Dr. Bornia, uh, group at NIHS, uh, the Herb K project that I talked about uh, was in collaboration with Dr. Sang. And then uh, obviously uh, all the work that I presented today is a product of you know, um, uh, PhD students, uh, undergraduate students and postdocs in, in my lab. Um, and obviously um, uh, you know, there's a lot more information that you, you, you can get on these topics uh, using the labs website and uh, I'll be happy to uh, take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Alberto. Very interesting uh, conversation. Um, so I would like to encourage everybody to, uh, to type your questions in the Q&A. Um, I have uh, some questions here already. So uh, the first one is, uh, it looks like a question about just a clarification. Is a tomogram just an image? Right. Yeah, that's a good question, and I, I, I was not completely clear. So you are completely right having that question. Um, a tomogram refers to the three D volume. So I was going back and forth between two D and three D. So sometimes I may have mislabeled uh, a tomogram by an image. But uh, yeah, so an image, it's we call it typically micrograph in in CRAOEM, and a tomogram will be the three D equivalent. Okay, thank you. So uh, next question is, um, is the denoising done with an autoencoder? Uh, not in this case, no, because yeah, we don't have uh, clean versions of our images for, for training. Uh, 
So, you know, I can share more details offline about the particular architecture, but we're using a, a blind spot CNN uh, for the noise in this case. Okay, I see. Um, okay. Um, uh, and so, uh, again, uh, if you have any questions, please uh, just type them in the, the Q&A um, uh, uh, window. Uh, we have one more question here. Um, do you have to consider charging for uh, biological samples like you would when using SEM? Yes, definitely. So, you know, cryofibsem, I only mentioned, you know, once, but that's an entire field on its own. Uh, and yeah, so definitely that that process, you know, is very prone to charging and you know, other, you know, a variety of other effects that I didn't, you know, go into any level of detail. Um, so yes, you know, there, there's a lot of details about, you know, the experimental part on how to actually prepare the lamella and how to actually collect the data. Um, you know, there's multiple steps involved, and you know, there's always new technology, you know, trying to, you know, minimize. Uh, those effects, but but yes, it's charging something that we, you know, we worry about all the time. Okay, um, so it's no more questions here uh, from the audience for now. But so I'll I'll ask uh, a a more general question. Uh, could you comment on? Um, working in a field that really requires a, a, a what appears to be a quite broad expertise right spanning uh, certainly from from questions in uh, you know chemistry right and uh, uh, all the way to computer science and you know deep learning yes that's a great point um um, oh, I think somebody's complaining that the chat, chat is disabled. Yeah, that's a good point. This is definitely, you know, encompasses a broad range of uh, disciplines and areas. Um, so, so my take is, you know, it's very hard if you just want to be able to, um, you know, cover all the areas at, at, the, at the very, you know, with a lot of uh, um, depth, right? It's just it's just too much to 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 be able to you know to learn in a lifetime. <laughs> so I think the key is to just you know make sure that you focus on one particular area, but then you know you you can uh, communicate to the 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 area next to you in a very effective manner. So you know I can tell you that without that communication, you know things definitely don't work. And if you also try to cover, you know, too many areas, then, you know, the, the efforts becomes, you know, very ineffective. Um, so I think that's what you were uh, you know, uh, trying to get at. And, and I think, you know, yeah, it, it's, it, it, it's critical. Now in my group, it's a multidisciplinary group. And, you know, they all cover, you know, slightly different area with some overlap. And I think that's, you know, at least for us, that's the key for making making things work. Yeah. No, I think that's uh, it's nowadays some of the most exciting discoveries in science come from that ability to communicate uh, be between uh, uh, d disciplines that didn't have traditionally a lot of communication. So I think that's exciting, but definitely comes from comes with uh, challenges, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think there's, you know, even like language barriers, because, you know, some of these areas, you know, even when you're talking about signal processing, uh, you know, ideas, they they use different terminology. And, you know, it's not straightforward for everybody to be on the same page. So, yeah, even, you know, language barrier, I think, is the first one to uh, that you have to overcome. Okay. So I do have a couple more questions from the audience. Um... Uh, to what extent uh, was knowledge of math mathematics, especially a more spatial uh, oriented math like uh, linear algebra uh, necessary in this endeavor? 
Yeah, again, I think that's one of the focus areas. Um, so on the overall picture, uh, you know, you do need to get very deep on that uh, particular area. Um, but then again, in, in combination with, you know, or complementarity with, you know, the, the biochemistry and, you know, the imaging and, and all of the other areas. Um, so there's a lot about, you know, it's just, you know, hardcore uh, signal processing that actually relies very heavily, you know, on, on linear algebra and geometry and all these other subfields, you know, mathematics. Okay. Uh, another question. Uh, I am curious if uh, for this field, the target for using deep learning slash machine learning uh, is a tool for some specific already solved targets and the novelty slash contribution of the work is in chemistry part, but not the machine learning, deep learning part. Yes, that's a good point. Uh, I would say both. So we obviously have some very, you know, difficult problems in terms of the biology that you can just, you know, get some like off the shelf tools and it will work just like that, right? Uh, that's like the low hanging fruit. But you know, a lot of one of the things that I wanted to convey in this presentation was that you know uh, the data in some cases you know is not the easiest to deal with, uh, and in many cases you know facing these hard problems you know forces you to come up with you know innovative solutions that haven't been uh, you know proposed before. So I'll say you know it's is uh, the two things combined, and uh, you know obviously you know we. We like to take on, you know, challenges where, you know, there's not necessarily tools out there that you know, already work off the shelf. Uh, so if anything, we want to focus on, you know, the, you know, trying to come up with, uh, you know, new ideas that can actually, you know, be utilized in other areas as well, other than CrowdEM. Yeah. Uh, another question here. Uh, although, this is AI enhancing the um, the experience. I think that uh, maybe he mean the experience. I say again. I think it's probably experiment. Uh, yeah, yeah, likely. Okay. Uh, can you benefit from feeding uh, predicted structure structures into the recognition? process yeah I, I think it's... yeah so th this is um yeah that, that's a good point so you know i think the general team just so, well, for people that are not in the in the field is you know this um this protein predictions that you know done by alpha pole right uh and because it's being done for you know uh, 200 million proteins so it's you know, a large number of proteins uh, the question is whether you can actually utilize this information, right, uh, to help you in this, you know, when you're doing experimental structure determination. So in, in this particular case, when we're talking about detection, uh, we're not, uh, it's mainly, uh, uh, we're mainly trying to locate where proteins are. We're not trying to, you know, determine their identities, uh, at, at least at the very, you know, the very initial stage of doing protein detection. Um, so having, you know, like a high resolution atomic model uh, is not necessarily helpful because, you know, we mainly only care about locating things. Uh, you know, we worry about identity, you know, later or on in the pipeline, you know, during structure determination, but I didn't, you know, I, I didn't mention, you know, any of that in, in today's talk. Um, so I think the short under answer is no. For, for detection, you know, is uh, in the context that we are doing things in SmartScope and, you know, um, uh, weekly supervised protein detection is not gonna help us to have, you know, high resolution models of proteins. Yeah. All right, uh, we're at the top of the hour. Uh, thank you very much, Alberto. You a very interesting uh, presentation and discussion. Uh, thank you everybody uh, for attending. Uh, we will uh, have the seminars uh, monthly on the uh, first uh, Tuesday uh, of the month uh, at, uh, at noon. 
Uh, and so, yeah, we hope to to see you here again. And uh, until until next time. All right. Thank you very much.